welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Father, we thank you for the word of God that has the power and the life in it to change us and to save our souls, to rearrange our thinking. Father, tonight as we open your word, we pray, Almighty Father, that you would open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears. I ask that you would help me to speak truth tonight, that, Lord, you would put a watch over my tongue to say what is necessary and to refrain from saying what isn't. I ask, Almighty Father, that the Holy Spirit would work a work of wonder in every heart and every life that is in this sanctuary and to those that would listen to this tape. I ask, Father, that you would heal hearts tonight. Father, where there's been hurt and there's been disappointment, Holy Father, that you would put your sovereign hands around every woman heart, Lord, and you would heal fragile hearts that have been broken. And I pray for the men and for the sons, Father, that you would give them insight and you would help them to understand and live with understanding these amazing daughters that you've given to them as gifts. Father, we thank you for your divine plan. It is a beautiful plan. It's a glorious plan. And help us to live it out so that people can see Jesus in the church. We ask it in Jesus' precious and wondrous name. And Father, we just want you to know that we want to fall in love with your son more and more. That at this church, our prayer and our cry is to know the son, to fall in love with him. That we may know him in the power of his resurrection, in the fellowship of his suffering. We love him, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, he is the divine romantic, our father. He invented all of this. It's really quite amazing when you think about God the Father, that he, he created romance. He created love. That is his nature. And the very first session that I had with you, I said that the very amazing thing about marriage is that it is a picture and a typology of Jesus and the church. And that when you look at a Christian marriage, that it's a, a brushstroke and it's a portrait of Jesus and the church. And I believe the enemy works very, very hard on Christian marriages to divide us. And Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And a family divided against itself cannot stand. And God is a God of one and a God of unity. And he is reconciling all things back to himself. He's in a reconciliation program. He's in a restoration program. God is reconciling a universe back to himself. And we actually are watching this, and we as believers have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness. We've been brought into the kingdom of God, and we have a new nature, the nature of God. Agape love is God's nature, and we've been given this brand new nature, and we are fleshing it out, and we're learning how to walk in the love of God and work out this love in our lives. And marriages are actually, the family is actually the test tube and the awesome place where we learn how to live out this amazing new nature of agape love, the love of God, his nature, who he is. And just like Adam was alone, and God first brought creation to Adam, and Adam had to know that he was alone, and God said everything in creation was good, except one thing, that Adam was alone. And so God made creation, and God brought creation to Adam, and Adam saw male and female, but there was no counterpart for Adam. There was no one that could stand face to face with Adam. No one. Not one thing in creation was like him. And then God put Adam to sleep, and Adam had never been asleep. God put him to sleep, and out of the very being of Adam, God brought forth and created his last creation. And her name was woman, and she came out of Adam. She was not created out of the dust. She was created out of the man. And out of the man she came, and that which was in Adam came forth out of Adam. And this amazing being, this beautiful creation, this creature, he brought to the man, and she could now stand face to face with him. And she had his nature. And she could now see him, and he could now see her. And they could be one together. And he said, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and he shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and they shall be one. So there we get this, again, this symbolism of oneness and unity 
And we get out of the two is one. And from the one comes a family. And from a family comes a tribe. And from a tribe comes a nation. And from nations comes the earth. And, and so God has this beautiful plan. And this family, this marriage, this, this very beginning of creation is God's idea. Now, when the fall happened, so much was separated and so much was, was splintered. And so now we have this imperfect union and 50% of marriages in the United States are separated in divorce and 50% of Christian marriages are separated in divorce. And this ought not to be in the church. Now, Jim and I were divorced. We both came from divorced backgrounds. I mean, he was divorced three times before he was 25. He was really, really bad. Everybody kicked him out. I mean, he married everybody and they all divorced him. I was only divorced once because I lived with everybody after I was divorced once. And so he was much worse than I was. <laughs> I'm just teasing. So Jim and I, when we got married, we knew we couldn't blow this because to whom much is forgiven, there's much love. And we knew what not to do, but we didn't know what to do. And so we went to a faith convention on our honeymoon. We, we started our marriage in the Word of God. We were two young people that didn't, we never dreamed in a million years we would ever pastor a church who would ever have us. We'd screwed up too much. We were going to be business people. That's all we ever thought we'd be. And Jim, we went to this amazing convention in Anaheim in 1979. On January 20th, we got married, and Jim took me. That's where we went on our honeymoon. So we started with the Word of God in our marriage, and that was 35 years ago. And out of that, out of that lesson and out of this beautiful journey that we've had, God's brought forth children. We brought a blended family together. And God's brought forth children, and now we've got 12 grandchildren. Our oldest grandson got married last year, and we could be great-grandparents someday. Parker's in the Navy. He's not having any kids yet. But, I mean, we are on a journey, and now he's 68, I'm 63, so we're grandparents, and we're old people now. And we are looking back with hindsight, and, and here we are talking about marriage, and we know what not to do, and, and we are signposts to you telling you these are some things we've learned. These are some things we've done and some things that we know that God has said. Now, whenever we teach on marriage, naturally, we're going to have the biggest fights we've ever had. And so what I'm teaching on today, I had the biggest fight with my husband last week, and he said, you're not doing this. And I says, well, good, then you can preach this tonight because I'm not preaching it because you said I'm not doing it. But you see, he, he doesn't, he's not right because I was doing it. He just couldn't see it. And when I told him that, he says, oh, you were so deceived. <clears throat> Have you guys ever fought like that? What, you don't think your pastors fight? Listen, as, as long as we are flesh and blood on this planet, we're going to have to work at our salvation just like you are. But one thing about Jim and I, we may fight, but we don't go to bed mad and we love each other. You're going to fight in marriage and things aren't always going to be good. And there's going to be good seasons and there's going to be bad seasons. There's going to be times of plenty and there's going to be times of lack. There's going to be times when you've made right decisions and there's going to be times when you're going to go, oh, what were we thinking? There's going to be times when there's going to be great, great, great joy and victory and then there's going to be times when there's tears. That's life. But if you stay together and if you love God and if you do his word, God promises that he'll be faithful and he'll walk you through life and you'll not leave this earth disappointed. And he says, David wrote in the Psalms and he says, I've been young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed out begging for, bed, for bread. God is faithful. And Jim and I can stand here as living memorials to this next generation and we can say God is faithful and you can trust him and you can live in his word and these commandments are true and they are right. And whether Jim and I do them perfectly or not, they are right. And they have lasted and they've stood the test of time and they work. And tonight's commandment for the woman number two is, are you ready? Women, let the husband be the head of the house. Now, commandment number one was women submit unto the husband as unto the Lord. Now, girls, it seems like we get the raw end of the deal sometimes. It's, you know, it's always about submission and it's always about obedience. And last week, or not last week, but two weeks ago, 
I taught about submission and God's authority because God's a God of authority. And I'm not going to go back over that because I don't have time. But get that, get that. You can download that online. It was a great teaching. It's not, I don't say that because I'm a great teacher, but I say that because the word of God is awesome and it came straight out of the word of God. God's a God of authority. God has established authority. He's established different reigns and lines of authority. There's spiritual authority. There's domestic authority. There's corporate authority. There is different lines of authority. And, and in the home, domestic authority, God has set the husband as the head of the house. So let's read that in Ephesians chapter 5. Are you ready? Ephesians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So verse 24 says, just as the church is subject to Christ. That word is hupotasso. It's the same word as submit. It means to come under the authority of the husband. So let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she reverences or respects her husband. So commandment number two, and we find this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 23, for the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church. He is a savior of the body. Verse 24, therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. What does that mean? It means that just as a church is under the authority that Christ is the head of the church, so let the wives understand that their husbands are the head of the house. And wives, that means that you and I, as the wives, have to let our husbands be the head of the house. Now, that may seem like a simple thing. And one time when, when I was newly married to Jim and, and we were looking at this and we were learning this, someone explained it to us like this. It's like a husband is the roof of the house. He's the covering. He's the, he's the thing that, he is the roof that protects and covers that house. Have you ever been in a house that didn't have a roof on it? There's a storm or a rainstorm, you're going to get really wet, right? We're building a house right now. We're in construction. As a matter of fact, I've got boots on right now because my feet were sore, so I put my construction boots on and they were all dirty. And I told Jim, oh my gosh, they're full of construction dirt. And the roof is, is half on. And, and that means when the rains come, we can still get wet under that construction project. But you see, when a husband is operating, he is operating as a covering and as a protection over the family. And he covers the family because God's placed him in that place of spiritual and delegated authority. Now, girls, that means that we have to let them be the roof. Now, here's my problem. And this might be your problem, girls. Sometimes over the years, there's been some leaks in the roof. Can I get a witness in the house? Yeah. And because we are still humans and we're not perfect wives yet, it's like you want to go plug up those leaks really fast because you've gotten wet there before. Can I get a witness? And that can really set off our guys. I know how to get on my husband's last nerve. I have a special talent for that. I am just a little vessel sent to teach him patience. <laughs> Not really. So God says, listen, girls, I want you to understand that these men are there for a reason in your life. And yes, they're not perfect. And yes, they're not going to make all the right decisions, but there's a position of authority like we looked at last time. You've got to let them. So what does that mean to me? Let, 
let my husband be the head. Well, I want to look at three things tonight about letting our husbands be the head of the house. I'm going to have to let my husband lead, which means influence. I can't manipulate. Mm. I'm going to have to let him lead, which means I'm going to have to learn how to put on a meek and a quiet spirit. What is that? And I'm going to have to let him lead, which means I can't be contentious and nagging, which means that Solomon seemed to have a little bit of insight into this. And a nagging woman in his life, he said it's better to dwell on a rooftop than with a contentious, nagging woman. Just because he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, I can't imagine why he said that. So can we have a little fun tonight and look at what God says? Girls, are you ready? Let's look at what it means to let our husbands be the head of the house. Number one, I'm going to have to let my husband lead, which means I'm going to have to watch how I influence him. Did you know, women, that you are more powerful than you know? You are. You have more influence than you know. And how I know that is by looking at the Word of God. And when you go back to Genesis and you go back to the law of first works in Genesis, you see that when the serpent came to disrupt God's plan, he didn't go to Adam, he went to the woman. And he went to the woman to get to the man. Now, why do you think he did that? Because he knew that if he got to the woman, she would get to the man. Because he knew she had influence. And she knew, he knew that she had the keys to his heart. Are you with me? You see, the enemy wants us to think that we're not important and that we don't have any influence or power. He wants us to think that we're stupid women and that men rule over us and that we don't have any influence or power, but that's absolutely not true. But God wants us to know that the influence that we use as godly women needs to be correct and it needs to be right. And God is very serious about this. So let's look at the word of God. Eve influenced Adam, Genesis 13, 7. This is God speaking to Adam. Then to Adam, God said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. So God says to Adam, because you listened to Eve and you didn't listen to me. Girls, we cannot get away from it. We pioneered sin. Mom, what were you thinking? But God, in his redemption and his mercy, let women pioneer salvation. So he's always redemptive, and he always restores that which the enemy has taken away. So before you start to feel bad about yourself, hang on, because we're not done. All right? Let's look at what God says. Solomon, the greatest king that ever lived, the wisest king that ever lived. This is what God said about Solomon. 1 King 11.4. For it was so. So when Solomon was old, now remember, Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. When Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Who's, who turned his heart away from God? Who? His wives. Now, God did say in Deuteronomy to the kings that they were not to have multiple wives. So Solomon was wrong. Let's just get that straight, okay? I just don't want you to think it's just the women. Solomon was in sin having 700 wives and 300 concubines, okay? That was not the plan of God. When God put Adam in the garden, he didn't pull out of Adam a dozen Eves. He pulled out one, okay? So we could just get that, guys, all right? One. And Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So if he had a problem with women, it might be because he was a little ambitious. I mean, what was the man thinking? What did he do in a year is what I want to know, but anyway. <laughs> so Solomon's wives influenced him. We're talking about influence. How about this one? Ahab and Jezebel. Ever heard of Jezebel? Look what God said about her. And look what God said about Ahab. 1 Kings 21, 25. But there was no one like Ahab. Now, Ahab was the seventh king of Israel. But no one was like Ahab, who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of God, because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. 
So Jezebel was an influence to stir up Abraham, Abraham, to stir up Ahab. In other words, Ahab married Jezebel, who was the daughter of a king of Sidon, Ethbaal, who was a priest of Baal, and she was a priestess of Baal, a princess of Baal, and she killed the prophets of God, and she caused Israel to worship Baal, and she tried to kill El Elijah, and she was a horrific woman, and you've heard of Jezebel in, in Revelation, and you've heard of people that say you have a Jezebel spirit. What are they saying? It's a woman that usurps authority, and the tribe to rule under a man and take that authority away from a man and God hates it. He hates it. Now I don't know about you but I do not want to get on the bad side of God. I want to stay where I am on the right side of the Father and the right side of the Son and the right side of the Holy Spirit. I want to be in my right spot. I do not want to be in my wrong spot. Because when I'm in my wrong spot, I do not have the blessing of God and the favor of God. I want to be right. I don't want to be wrong. All right? So God says, Debbie, as a woman of God, you have an opportunity to take your life, your, your influence on Jim, your sexual influence, your emotional influence, your intellectual influence, your ability to speak, all that you are, your being as a woman and your love that he has for you. You can take all that you are and you can influence him to evil or you can influence him to righteousness and good. Period. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I made a choice when I married the man of God that I will always influence to the ways of the Lord. Period. Period. And when I'm wrong, I'll repent and God help me to change. But I will influence to the ways of, of the Lord. So girls, number one, if we're going to let our husbands be the head of the house, always, always influence to good. Now, sometimes that means you are going to catch a little hell. Because that means sometimes you've got to put the feet to the fire. Hmm. Because they want to be the head of the house and they want to go in a direction that may not be so righteous. Hello? They may want to do some stuff that may not be squeaky clean. They want to, they're the head of the house and they want to go in this direction. And sometimes you've got to say, well, is that right? Is that the right way to go? And you see, sometimes you are the check and the balance in the house and something that they have to bounce off of. They're the head of the house and they're going to make the ultimate decision. But sometimes you have to be the sounding board of righteousness in that home, girls. And sometimes that's not always a safe and easy place to be because sometimes it means they're not going to like what you have to say, but you've got to speak the truth in love and you've got to be the right way to go always. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There have been times in our early marriage when Jim and I, especially when it came to some things with money, my goodness, when we first got married, Jim didn't like to pay taxes on time. I remember that. Yeah, you're all laughing because you don't either. We learned some hard lessons, didn't we? He's learned some hard, I've learned some hard lessons because I've been wrong on so many things. There's a couple of things he's been wrong on. Listen, what am I saying? Marriage is a journey. You're going to learn together. You're not always going to get it right. And sometimes one of you is wrong and one of you is right. And sometimes you're not going to agree. But the point is, if you both try to be righteous, if one of you will stay the course, even when the other one isn't, even if it means the other one's not going to like what you've got to say. But if it's the right thing to say and you've prayed it through, you're going to have to say it in love and not be afraid and stand your ground. It doesn't mean that you're not being, you're not letting them be the head of the house. You're not. It just means that you are being righteous and you've prayed about it and this is what you believe it is. And then you have to let them make the decision. And whatever decision that is going to be, it's going to be and you're going to have to pray it through. But let them be the head of the house. Influence them to righteousness always, always, always. Let them lead to good. Lead them to good and not to evil. Number two, let them lead. That means I'm going to have to put on a meek and a quiet spirit. What does that mean? Well, that means I'm going to have to learn about a new source of power because a meek and a quiet spirit is really important to God. And believe me, in my natural person, I do not have a meek and a quiet spirit. So let's find out what that is because that's something that's really important to God. First Peter chapter 3. Let's look there. Are you okay with me, girls, so far? Yeah, the boys aren't shouting on this one. 
Just what you need is a nagging wife. No, God doesn't want us to be nags, but he does want us to be honest. He does want us to be honest wives. First Peter chapter three, wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. When they observed your chaste conduct accompanied by fear, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. Now, I want to read that in the, New, or the King James. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. So God's speaking to the wives and he says, listen, when the, when the men aren't obeying the word of God, I don't want you to put on, adorn yourselves with, with clothing and with elaborate hair and with elaborate makeup. This is what I need you to put on, girls. I need you to put on a meek and a quiet spirit which is of great value to God. Now, I don't know about you girls, but when I see which is in the sight of God of great price, I stand up and take notice because I want to be a good wife and I want to be of great value to God. And God says, when you put on a meek and a quiet spirit, that's of great value to God. So what is that, God? What does that look like? Well, I am so glad you asked because for 25 years I've been studying this. And I have found out some amazing things about meekness and about quietness. And the word quiet there is hesukeia in the Greek. And it doesn't mean silence. It means to be at peace, that you do not easily get disturbed and you do not easily disturb other people. It means that you are not contentious. You're not a nag. Remember I told you about nagging? If we're going to let our husbands be the head of the house, it means stop nagging. Now, I don't know what your husband's like, but my husband, if it's more than once, it's nagging. Is that the general rule? Is that it pretty much? <laughs> Can we have fun with each other tonight? It's okay. How about more than twice? More than three times? Twice? Is twice good? Three times? Five? Five times? None of the men are saying anything tonight. They were all, oh boy, they were wrong last time. They are quiet tonight. Three times, more than twice. Okay, there's a very brave son back there that said twice. So more than twice, it's nagging. He's single. God says, listen, girls, I want you to put on a quiet spirit, Hesukeia. That means that you are not easily disturbed and you do not easily disturb others. Now, Jim says that sometimes it seems that my tone goes up like this and drives him nuts. Now, I don't even know I'm doing that. You know, Margaret Thatcher, when she was the prime minister of England, actually had to go to elocution classes. And she had to learn how to take her voice and bring it down because in Parliament, they mocked her voice so much because she was high-pitched as a woman. So girls, I think our voices, just by the very nature of our voices, bother men sometimes. Is that, is that true? Yeah. Yeah, yeah see, they're, they're not answering tonight. But you know what, can we just be honest in this house? And so I think, what if we say this is safe talk, nobody's gonna get in trouble? And God is, see, God knew, made us and he knows us. He knows the sons and he knows the daughters. And he wants us to love each other and he wants us to all get along and be in our spots so that we can have wonderful families and we can have prosperous homes and happy homes. So girls, it means that we gotta lower the tone. It means that we've gotta be conscious that with our men, that they, they don't like a high-pitched, fast-talking, uptight woman. That's offensive to them. And it's not, well, talk to the hand. We can't do that. You see, that's not of great value to God. So my husband doesn't like it, but God doesn't like it. So if God doesn't like it and my husband doesn't like it, then I shouldn't like it. 
And I'm talking about letting them lead. I'm talking about learning how to communicate. I'm talking about how to get along. I'm talking about how to have peace in the home. And if these are things I need to change and I need to get a clue about, I need to be savvy about, then let me grow up and let me do it at 63. Are you with me? It's not a bad thing. It's just, let's get, let's get savvy about this. We live in a world that is coarse and mean and cruel and selfish. And God says, I want my homes, I want my beautiful homes happy. And I want them blessed and sun-kissed. And I want anyone to be able to go in there and just feel the presence of peace and love and goodness. And girls, if God says, put on a meek and a quiet spirit, let the husband be the head of the home. And if I put on this quiet spirit that says, I learn how to calm down, I learn how to speak slower, I learn how not to get riled up over things that really aren't important. Have you ever noticed, guys, I mean, I'm on a construction project, so I'm in a man's world. I am really watching these men. It's amazing to me. They are definitely laid back. They don't get upset with each other. They get on the phone, they say a few words to each other. I mean, very few words. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, good. Click. That's it. That's the conversation. They get their jobs done. They stand around for a little bit and they're gone. It's like, I mean, women would, we would be talking about the world. We would be solving the problems of Obamacare right now. <laughs> the men are not doing that. They really are simple. And I don't mean like they're simple-minded. I mean, they really do have these waffles and they really do focus on things and they really get these things done and that's it and they move on. They're not spaghetti like we are. They really aren't that way. And girls, we really need to tone it down, calm down, and just get the job done. Listen, if you're in the marketplace with men, you, we need to do this. Let them be men and let's live in a world where we can all get along. Meek and a quiet, hesukeia, not easily disturbed and not disturbing others. So honey, I'm going to work on that. Before the church, I want to work on that. Now let's talk about meekness, a meek spirit. If I'm going to let my husband leave, then God says I'm going to have to put on a meek spirit. Now what's a meek spirit? And I'm so glad you asked. In just a few moments that I have left, can I tell you about a meek spirit? Because this is really very, very important. Now there are two kingdoms at work. I, am, I operate in the knowledge of two kingdoms. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of God. In the kingdom of darkness, Satan has a power force. In the kingdom of God, God has a power force. The kingdom of darkness has a power called force. The kingdom of God has a power called meekness. Are you with me? Now let me tell you what force is. Force. There's two types of power. The power of force and the power of meekness. The power of force and the power of meekness. The power of force and the power of meekness. Force. Cain kills Abel. First family, first murder. Follow me. God steps in, brings order by law, teaches man how to subdue force by force. Brought law, an eye for an eye, to present to this day the safeguards that are now in effect there is a dispensation of force. Paul writes and says that the magistrate bears the sword to bring law. We are in a dispensation of force. Are you with me? There is law and order. There are policemen. There are armies. We are in a dispensation of force. That means you force law. Are you with me? 2,000 years ago, the world was introduced to another kingdom based on other sanctions. In this kingdom, the inheritors of the earth are said to be meek, not the grasping or the violent. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Giving, not getting, is the means to prosperity. Wrongful acts are overcome by a counterattack of good deeds. Enemies are loved, blessed, kindly treated, not hated. Are you following me? The king of meekness demonstrated this unconquerable power when he went to Calvary. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight 
From that day onward, for all time, the cross has become the symbol for the human race to see a new, unknown, unused power, the unconquerable potency of a defenseless, quenchless, unconquerable, agape love where the lamb laid down on that cross and he conquered and he swallowed up the dragon by the love of God. So meekness is power under the control of agape love. It is not weakness. It is the very power of God under the control of agape. It is not the force of human flesh. It is the very power of God. That is why Jesus said to Peter, put your sword down. Those who live by the sword will die by it. And he picked up Malchus's ear and he put it back on his head when he, Peter cut Malchus's ear off in the garden. There's a greater power here in the kingdom than we know about. I'm talking about kingdom power that you and I don't understand. And I'm talking about marriages that look like Jesus in the church. And I'm talking about a world and a realm that is invisible. We live in this natural world. And that's all we know. And so in our marriages, we can go nose to nose in the flesh and we get nowhere. But if we will begin to step into the invisible kingdom of God, and if we'll be able to step in and put on Christ, and if men will begin to love their wives like Christ loves the church, as servant leaders, as men who will love their wives more than themselves and give of themselves to their wives, and if wives will love their husbands and respect and reverence their husbands and let them lead and put on a meek and a quiet spirit, you see, then these marriages suddenly begin to take on the very nature and the very look of heaven itself. You see, in heaven, the angels understand the power of meekness. In heaven, they understand the force and the power of agape that it creates everything. But here on the earth, all we know is the power of force, of the, of the feebleness of human power and human will. Is this too big of a concept? You see, we think of meekness as weak, as ineffective. But Jesus demonstrated it when he went through the gates of Jerusalem on a donkey. And he said, behold, your king comes to you, meek and lowly, riding on a donkey. He was born in a stable, in a manger, making a statement. The king of glory's first breath was of animal urine. And his last breath was of his own sweat and blood. What is God saying? He's saying, beloved, there's a power that you don't know anything about. There's a realm that is invisible that you don't yet understand. But I came preaching and teaching the kingdom. I came to bring you the kingdom of heaven. Fear not, little flock, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. I brought you a new nature. You're the bride. You are in bride training so that you will look like me because there's going to be a day when there's a wedding feast and you will know as you've been known and you will see as you've been seen. And right now you are in training on this planet to learn how to rule and reign in agape love and your marriages are the very test tubes of that. And the enemy wants to do everything he can to rip you apart and get you in the flesh. But if you'll understand these things, then when the enemy comes in, you'll not even give him one moment of power in your lives. You'll say, get behind me, Satan. You have no power in our marriage and no place in our hearts. Meekness. Meekness. The very power of God. Power under the control of love. What does meekness look like? Listen, it's not behavior modification, but heart transformation. The power is meekness, not force. Meekness is power under the control of agape love. What does it look like? Force is power on the circumference. Meekness is power at the center. Force is power on the outward, and it's local, it's fleshly. Meekness is power on the inward and universal. Force is power in the visible. Meekness is power in the invisible. Force appears strong. Meekness appears weak. Force is woman and man's human spirit putting forth its little energies Mental, verbal, to obtain its end. Meekness is God's spirit reigning in a man and a woman who first dies to all self-action.
attitudes and activities and working through that man or woman by his ways of love, faith, lowliness, long-suffering, the almighty works of God in that particular situation. What meekness is not, it is not weak and indifferent. What does it act like? One, meekness doesn't care what others think, only God. Matthew 21, 5. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the foal of an ass. Jesus showed meekness as he went through as the king. Two, meekness is under the control of agape love. Matthew 11, 28 and 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and I'm lowly of heart. And you'll find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy, Christos, and my burden is light. Easy, kindness, that word is where we get the word kindness. Agape is kind. It's easy. It fits. It's easy to put on. It suits you. Agape suits the situation. It finds out, and it's easy. It's kind. It fits every situation, and it fixes everything. Meekness, power under the control of agape. What is meekness? Meekness is teachable. Psalm 25, 9, the meek he will guide in judgment. The meek he will teach his way. A meek spirit never stops learning. It's not a know-it-all, but realizes they are never too old to learn from the young and never too young to learn from the old. A meek spirit is humble, not too proud to say, I'm sorry, I missed it. Or too hard-hearted to be corrected. Not too proud to admit they don't know what they're doing. Hungry to grow and to change. Number four, meekness yields. Goes with what others want. Doesn't have to have their way. God, help me to be a meek woman. Help me, Lord. First Peter 2.22. This is speaking of Jesus who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. He didn't bat it back and forth. He shut his mouth. He was meek. So what is force? It's power in the flesh. What is meekness? Power in the spirit. The bottom line, girls. God wants us to be influencers to our husbands of righteousness and goodness. We can only do this by agape love. We can only let our husbands lead by believing in them and loving them, yielding to them. We can only do this when we put on a meek and a quiet spirit, a meek spirit that says, I'm dying to my will and to my way, and I'm going to live to God's, and I'm going to trust God for this. I want to read you something about dying to ourselves, because that's really what it is in a marriage. This really is what it is. It's two people coming together not jockeying for positions, loving God and loving each other, learning how to die to the flesh and come alive to the spirit. To put on that meek spirit is to take off the flesh, to die to it, to come alive to the spirit. Dying to myself, for I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. When you are forgotten or neglected, or purposely set it not, and you don't sting and hurt with the insult or oversight, but your heart is happy, being counted worthy to suffer for Christ, that is dying to self. When your good is evil spoken of, when your wishes are crossed, when your advice disregarded, your opinions ridiculed, and you refuse to let anger rise in your heart or even defend yourself, but you take it all in patient, loving silence, that's dying to self. When you lovingly and patiently bear any disorder, any irregularity, any impunctuality, or any annoyance, when you stand face to face with waste, folly, extravagance, spiritual insensibility, and endure it as Jesus endured it, that's dying to self. When you are content with any food, any offering, any interruption by the will of God, that's dying to self. When you never care to refer to yourself in conversation or to record your own good works or itch after commendation when you can truly love to be unknown, that's dying to self. There's so much. I don't need to keep going. How do I use this in my life? 
Well, I have to be convinced and have a conviction that meekness really is a power force. It's really something I need to learn. Lord, I'm, I'm a child. What do I know about the kingdom? Teach me. I know how to use force. I know how to use personality. I know how to use voice. I know how to use uh, passion. I know how to use will. But God, meekness, how do I use that? Teach me. Teach me. You see, that's an adventure to want to learn to be like Jesus, to learn this new power. For the meek will inherit the earth. I don't know about you, but I want to learn this adventure. I want to learn it. So I have to be convinced it's really power. And two, I have to be willing to die daily to the old nature that still wants to rule in my life no matter how old I am, not be so discouraged that I want to quit, but realize that it's a journey, that he's not done with me. He's not done with you. He's not done with you. He's not mad at us. We're under construction. He's working on us. He believes in us. He believes in our marriages. He believes in the things that he has for us to do. He put us together. He was at our weddings. He called us. Sometimes my husband says, oh, I think you married the wrong man. And I say, no, I didn't marry the wrong man. Sometimes I just behave like the wrong woman. Help me, Lord, to be the right woman for the right man that God gave to me. Will you stand with me? Yes. Please. You know, it's no good to, to speak truth if we can't do something with it. I think there's marriages in here. Maybe we need to just talk to each other a little bit today. Jim, I'd like to apologize. I just want you to know that I'm so blessed to be your wife. And I'm sorry that I get so high strung. You know, my mom never gave me Ritalin. I want to. I know you do. I admire you and I love you. You know, Deb and I uh, this week had a fight over this subject. Uh, you know, so you might as well just know this. I mean, everybody comes into the house of God, you know, you may be a... Maybe you have churches that where the pastors are perfect. This is not one of those churches. This is a, a church where the pastors are real. And um, instead of trying to pretend like everything is so perfect and aren't they wonderful, we're people who are just like you. And we'll fight, we'll argue. And she's tough as nails, man. And she's you nobody know, to be pushed around. She's smart as a whip. And uh, I'm, not a, I'm not as smart as she is, and I know that. But I'm bigger. And, uh, you know, and so she, this week, we, we had a, a big fight. We had a big fight over the fact that it, it was this subject. And, and you know, I, I didn't even know that this was her subject this week. I hadn't even really thought about which commandment she was on. I was doing my own stuff. And, and um, just, the, just the commandment of letting your husband be the head of the house. And she's, I, I literally last week answered the phone. Hello, this is the second most opinionated person in the world. I know it's you on the other end of the phone, and you're the first most opinionated person in the world. And so Deb and I uh, are very strong personalities that are not afraid to say how we feel, and which is that outward portion of it, you know. And so kind of went at it and did all that kind of stuff. And I was really curious tonight how she was going to deal with getting in the pulpit. In fact, yesterday she had said to me, she says, uh, I don't think I can get in the pulpit because, um, you know, I haven't been doing this. I feel like a hypocrite. And I said, you know, if we just preach what we do, then we're back to John 3.16. You know, that's, that's the truth. We're all in this together. We're all working this. 
We have a right to preach what's truth, not just preach what we do. My goodness, if we preach what we do, what happens when you don't do it? Then you only preach the little stuff that you do. And so, as ministers, you know, we have to preach what's truth, whether we do it or don't do it, and that's between us and God. And that's when it comes along and, you know, you have to be really honest. I, I want you to know something, Deborah. I thought your message tonight was amazing, number one. And, uh, and uh, I, I thought the way you carried yourself and uh, the humility that you show, how could I not do anything but love you and take care of you and provide for you and protect you and still boss you around, but I'm still, uh, I'm, I, I'm still gonna be a man because I underline those words in, in, uh, in um, Genesis 3.17, because you listen and hearken to the voice of your, Lord, your wife. <laughs> so there's times to listen and there's times when you know that it's God. I don't know, Deb and I are like you. We're still working on this. But isn't it good that even though we're not perfect, we have a perfect God. And we didn't come into the house to celebrate Jim and Debbie. We came in the house to celebrate a perfect God. Is anybody listening? And he's worthy of your applause. He's worthy of your praise. He's worthy of the goodness. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he is perfect. And we can always tell you about that. Mama, I love you. Give me a kiss. Mm. But wait, I, I think the Lord wants to do something. Because I taught a truth tonight that is... It may be deep, but it's truth. And it is about a meek spirit. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And it is a power force. It is the power of the kingdom. It's power under the control of love. And I think that we live in a world of force, and that's all we know. And we can get confused, and we think that that's all, uh, that it's, it's weak to be like Jesus. But it's not. And so I believe that God would, would be pleased with us. First of all, the women, it says that when we put on a meek and a quiet spirit, it's of great value to the Lord. So girls, how many of you in here would like to learn to put on a meek and a quiet spirit? Really, truly. Okay, then would you like to ask the Lord to help us? Because we're women, and he made us that way, and I can't lower my tone, and I don't feel like, do you ever feel like, gosh, I'm not getting excited. Why do you say I'm getting excited? Do you ever feel like that when the men say that to you? It's like... I'm fine. What are you talking about? So, guys, maybe you need to work with us a little bit because we don't know that we sound that way to you, okay? So will you work with us? Sons, will you work with us? Okay, so let's just, girls, let's just lift our hands. I'm going to pray over us. Father, here are the daughter. Here we are. You made us with high pitches. You made us sopranos. You gave us the spaghetti so we keep the family alive. <laughs> You made us women, and we're so glad. So, Father, will you help us to become women that are not easily disturbed, and we do not easily disturb others, that we are women that are at peace and in faith, and that we are dispensers of peace and givers of goodness and love. Help us to influence our families to godliness and honesty and integrity. Help us to not be fearful of anything and to be women that are strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. We thank you in Jesus' name. And men, how many of you would like to learn how to be still a man, but instead of doing the force that's physical, do the force of God, which is meekness that changes the world that we live in, you know, because it's, we, us guys only know how to, you know, I mean, give me some time alone, I'm watching boxing, you know, and it's force, you know, and so we don't know how to do anything. We invent sports that are force, football, pushing everybody around, we'll push that team back, push that team back, you know, I mean, just name it. I mean, what woman ever, ever invented a sport? Don't tell me it's shopping, it's not a sport. <laughs> and so, I mean, men have this competition thing where we totally and completely understand the force of physical force. 
And yet, in order for us to be like Jesus, we're going to have to put to work a different force and learn how to be meek ourselves, which is allowing the Spirit of God uh, inside of us to change the outside instead of the outside changing the circumstances. You following what I'm saying? So if you'd like that, men, just raise your hand and let's pray. Father, here we are, men of God. And uh, Lord, we don't know how to do this. This is totally different. You know, it's like Jesus says, when a man hits you on your right cheek, I should have written the Bible, Lord. I should have said, then you knock his teeth out. But God, that's not the force we're talking about. We're talking about turning your cheek. And he's given us a demonstration of a different way of operating in agape love because love never fails. So Lord, with our wives and with our jobs and friends, people around us, Lord, uh, let us continue to be men. We, we want to be men. We're going to express ourselves to be men, of course, Lord, but let us operate in this new force, this new power force that supersedes the natural physical world, but changes in the spirit realm, and that's the force, Father, of God, which is meekness. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory. Show us how to do this. Change our hearts. Here's our hearts, Lord. We give it to you. Show us how to do this so that we can be people that operate like Jesus did, that change the world in his meekness. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. Men with a great big, bold, a masculine, what? Amen. No, I'm finished. Okay, we got to get going here. Aw, was that awesome? That was awesome. Different, wasn't it? Awesome. Okay, wow. It's 25 after, so we have to hurry. We're not going to do the offering confession tonight because of the time. So let's take up an offering and receive tonight's tithes and offering. Is that okay? Absolutely. If you're giving to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center tonight by cash or by credit card, you need an envelope, just go ahead and raise your hand. And Oh, my heart is so full. I was just thinking as Jim was talking, I was thinking about the courage that it took for Jesus to go to that cross and not open his mouth, to not say a word. You talk about a man's man. If there was ever anyone that could teach a man how to be a man. It's God himself. So let's um, go ahead and write our checks out to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. You know, I don't know what to say. My heart's so full. My prayer for this church is that we would fall in love with the son, that we would know him like we've never known him before. Because when you, you get to get a glimpse of him, he's God's language to us. If you want to know what God looks like and what God is saying, look at Jesus. He's the Word made flesh. And so as we give in tonight's offering, I need some help. I'm stuck. That's enough words. Sit down. All right. Let's bring our checks and our offerings onto the Lord. Ushers, go for it. Here, take mine too. And then, uh, Lori, would you do, somebody, would one of you guys, there's somebody dropped all kinds of M&Ms up here. There's like four or five of them, and we're going to step them in, uh, and ruin our carpet. So if you could see an M&M in front of you, could you just pick it up and, um, and not, I don't want to ruin the carpet. Okay, now, here's what I want to do. Uh, if you're in tonight, where's Pastor Joel? Come up here, Pastor Joel. I'm going to dismiss the people. Some of you... Hear me now. Hear, hear, hear me. You need to give your heart and life to Jesus tonight. Tonight you need to be born again. You need to go to heaven, not hell. And you need to give God all of your heart and your life. And Pastor Joel, right here, will pray with you. All you have to do is come up and approach him. He'll, he'll, he'll pray with you. It just takes a few moments. Don't leave tonight without... Some of you are not right with God. Some of you have not made God Lord and Savior of your life. You know him in your head. There's no doubt about it. You have mental ascension and mental agreement about him. You don't have a problem with it. 
but you haven't yet given him all of your heart. And you do not get saved because you go to church or you're a nice person or cute, smart, talented, or gifted. You get saved because you gave God all of your heart and all of your life. That's what born again means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. If you want to be born again, head for heaven. You're going to have to give God all of your heart and all of your life. And we'll pray for you right after church service. And Pastor Joel will be right up here. See here, right here. Wave at him. Give him a smile. Okay? I don't want you to think he's going to be mad at you or make you feel weird or anything. Just get up out of your seat instead of leaving. Come up here and you know who you are and you need to do that and stop messing around with God. So I'm honest with you. Let's do it. Let's get right with God. Stand to your feet and let's go home. Ready? I'm going to pronounce a blessing over you. Father, these are your people. Come on, raise your hands. Called by your name, blessed in the city. Wives, if you're there, hug your husbands. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming, blessed going, that everything they put their hand to, they shall prosper. And Lord, with a great big shout about the Inland Empire, we say that the Inland Empire shall be saved. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me. And then he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins. That I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth, that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.